everything, including the microphone, everything. Yes. You can move around and hmm. Good morning. Uh, today, this morning, we're going to be talking about the doctor-patient relationship, as the slide shows. Felipe is, uh, that's me, it's my name. I am a retired pediatrician and I have a master's in bioethics, which is what I do now. So the doctor-patient relationship. I always like to start any talk with a definition of terms. The arrow won't work. Which one? The arrow to make the slides change. Does it work? Yeah. Oh, I just didn't hit it hard enough. Yeah. All right. All right. I always like to start any talk with a definition of terms because it's really important that we understand the language that we use and that we know exactly what we mean by each of the terms that we use. So let's start with ethics. Ethics is the branch of philosophy that deals with values, values relating to human conduct with respect to the rightness or the wrongness of certain actions and to the goodness and badness of the motives and ends of such actions. What about morals? Morals are principles, standards or birth or habits with respect to right or wrong conduct Ethical decisions cannot be separated from the moral sensibilities that shape them or isolated from the moral actors. Rules we choose to follow, principles we select are in some part a reflection of our belief system and our character in a way. So let's do some basic concepts. Must have done something wrong here, Henry. Move on to the slides. Yeah. Uh, right here? Yeah, the last one. Oh, far away. Yes. Okay. I leaned on the mouse. Yeah, right. We'll let you go to the next slide. No, 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 not yet. No. All right. So, <clears throat> let's start with some basics. And we'll go all the way back to the ancient Greeks, Aristotle. You all know who Aristotle was. He was an ancient Greek. He was a very smart man. He was also a pagan. So Aristotle defined virtue, and he defines virtue by the terms competence in the pursuit of excellence. For Aristotle, the virtuous man was principled. The, his ultimate goal was to become a man of excellence, thereby attaining happiness. So the goal was happiness. So happiness resided in full human flourishing with the chief good for man and could be secured in whatever life was most satisfying. So if you decided to become a carpenter, you would want to be the best carpenter that you could be. If you wanted to be a priest, the best priest. If you wanted to be an attorney, the best lawyer that you could be. That's how you would attain happiness, by fulfilling your, by, by your human flourishing to, you know, to the maximum. So this brings to mind, it might uh, to, to you as well, it brings to mind our Declaration of Independence. Our founding fathers knew about Aristotle. And if you remember, our Declaration of Independence talks about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this is exactly the same thing. You have to be alive in order to, to exercise your freedom so that you can pursue your happiness and flourish you know, at, your, at your maximum. Man's virtue was linked with action. So it's not just necessary to be virtuous. That is very important. It's actually, it's the, it's the building block, but that virtue must be exercised. So it's linked with action. Virtue was acquired by doing virtuous acts, enhanced by repetition of these acts. So the more acts you, virtuous acts you, you practice, the more virtuous the individual becomes. And if you do many virtuous acts, eventually you will become, you will develop what is called a habit. And this habit is a habit of virtuous acts. So 
the activity resulted in this virtuous disposition that we call the habit. Virtue and the virtuous person, uh, adept at finding moral goodness in real situations were an intrinsic part of moral behavior. Moral goodness, so you're faced with a choice. You have to choose the moral good or the moral bad. The virtuous man or woman with choice would choose the moral good. Thomas Aquinas was a philosopher, theologian of the 13th century. He was a, a, a monk, he was a priest, and he expanded on Aristotle's theory of morality. The purpose of virtue was to achieve happiness. Happiness was twofold. At one level, proportionate to man's nature, at one level, the natural level, and obtained by human reason. At a higher level, man is directed to go beyond the natural level, to the supernatural level, to the knowledge of God. Now remember that he was a religious person, he was a theologian, so he, he, he imparted theology and Christianity to the teachings of Aristotle, who was a pagan. Aquinas grounded his history, his, uh, his uh, theory of morality in the natural law. The universe is organized with a purpose. Each individual part of nature has a goal in itself. Natural law is the law of nature grounded on na the nature of things. All things to which people have a natural inclination as apprehended by reason were considered to be good. Preservation of life, the propagation of the species, the contrary were evil. He considered the contrary to these evil. The purpose of the natural law was to drive man to reach for the good and reject evil. Because natural law, sorry, because natural law is based on human nature and appreciated through reason, human nature being the same everywhere, moral law is the same for all men. No matter what, where you live, no matter what your ethnic background is, no matter what your beliefs are, Aquinas declared that natural, also, also known as moral law, was morally binding and universal because it was grounded on reason, a quality possessed by all men. Since natural law was understood through reason, even those who do not believe ought to recognize this, their obligation to self and to others. As a Christian, Aquinas' teaching is based on theology. He believed the purposeful organization of the universe was the work of the creator God. Man's consummation, this full flourishing of man, was a was attained in the knowledge of God. Remember that. So moral law provides an objective standard for right and wrong. Moral law, natural law. Moral law should serve as a standard for the laws enacted by civil government, what we call civil law. Let's get closer to medicine now. The medical tradition of the Western world is traced to the ancient Greeks, again, ancient Greeks at about the same time as, Apoc as uh, Aristotle, thereabouts, a little bit earlier, and the school of Hippocrates. Aristotle was about 300 years before Christ. Uh, Hippocrates was, was about 400 years before Christ. The ancient Greek physician was both healer and executioner. So euthanasia was an accepted practice in the medical profession. One physician would heal, the other one would kill depending upon what was asked of him. The Hippocratic School, a small group of Greek physicians about 400 years before Christ, initiated a change in this practice. The school wrote what is called the Hippocratic Oath, and the oath established a set of moral principles that were to guide the practice of medicine. The original oath of Hippocrates began with a covenant to the gods. Again, Hippocrates was an ancient Greek and he was a pagan. So the gods, lowercase gods, followed by duties and ended with a promise not to break the oath under punishment of dishonor. The physician declared a covenant with his patient to do good and not to harm. 
that's beneficence and non-maleficence. These are terms that you may have heard before from Father Chofi. And to always act in a just way to others, which is justice. So he established these principles of do no harm, benefit the patient, and be just in your dealings with the patient. Give the patient what is the patient's due. In time, the notion of the physician healer became the norm. And then the physician executor, executioner, I should say, role was rejected. The Hippocratic School introduced the concept of the practice of medicine as a moral commitment, a moral obligation of the physician to his patient. The physician made a covenant with his patient, with the gods as his witness. A covenant and a contract are agreements between two persons or two groups. Oh, okay. On doing something or not doing something. A covenant is an alliance, a fiduciary relationship. It's an alliance based on trust, based on trust between the two parts. Contract is a business-like agreement, and maybe in some cases with an underlying sense of distrust. For the first time, there was a complete separation between curing and killing. With the Greeks, the distinction was made clear. The medical profession was to be dedicated to life. The practice of medicine became a transcendent moral activity. Margaret Mead was a secular anthropologist of the past century. She is recorded as having made this statement, and I will read that statement to you. For the first time in our tradition, there was a complete separation between killing and curing. Throughout the primitive world, the doctor and the sorcerer tended to be the same person. He, with the power to kill, had power to cure. The sorcerer was the medicine man of old days. He who had power to cure would necessarily also be able to kill. With the Greeks, said Margaret Mead, the distinction was made clear. One profession were to be dedicated completely to life under all circumstances, regardless of rank, age, or intellect, the life of a slave, the life of the emperor, the life of a foreign man, the life of a defective child, all the same. But society, she added, but society always is attempting to make the physician into a killer to kill the defective child at birth, or maybe before birth, which is what we call abortion, to leave the sleeping pills beside the bed of the cancer Patient. This is interesting that she added that. This was in the mid 20th century, many years ago. And now, you know, in the 21st century, we've seen a resurgence of this uh, impetus or this, you know, push by society to make the physician into a killer again. So that, that uh, executioner role that was abolished with, Hipp with Hippocrates is, is coming back. And you may have seen all this, uh, the the, uh, uh, the all that you see in the, you know in the news about physician-assisted suicide in, in Western Europe, in Canada, and in this country. There's a number of states in the United States that have legalized physician-assisted suicide. So in these cases, the physician is the executioner. Yeah. So the Hippocratic principles were embraced by the Hebrew Christian tradition. By the, by the early Middle Ages, the Islamic tradition also accepted the Hippocratic principle. So from the Middle Ages on, these principles pretty well ruled the practice of medicine, not just in the Western world, but in the East as well. And the principles of beneficence, to do good, non-maleficence, to refrain from doing harm, and justice guided medical ethics through the Middle Ages to the present times. And the relationship of the doctor to his patient became a relationship based on trust. The practice of medicine is a moral endeavor. Three things about medicine is a human activity, make it a moral enterprise. The nature of illness, the act of profession, the non-proprietary nature of medical knowledge. Medical knowledge begin, belongs or to society. It is not any one person's purview. The act of healing, the act of healing, 
in the context of a professional oath. This is the traditional definition. The practice of medicine was described like this. The immediate goal of the physician-patient encounter is helping and healing through the science and art of medicine. The morality of the medical encounter includes moral intent, moral choice, and moral action. Remember, virtue and action are linked. What about the ends of medicine? What are the ends of medicine? The ends of medicine of the, are the ends of the doctor-patient relationship, and, the, and these ends are health, cure, and care. Virtues are essential for the medical encounter to benefit the patient. Beneficence. Professional virtue is that disposition or trait of character that entitles the individual, that enables the individual with excellence of intent and action to reach the goal of a specific professional activity. For every profession, there is a specific activity. For medicine, the activity is healing. So how do these philosophical definitions that we've been talking about so far, uh, how do these philosophical definitions that we've been talking about so far apply to medicine? So virtue that is practiced becomes a habit. We already said that. The habits that dispose a physician to heal with excellence are the virtues of medicine. The virtues inherent to medical practice provide the physician, the doctor, with the habits that will lead him or her to choose the moral action. The virtues inherent to medical practice are fidelity to trust, and that is the doctor-patient relationship is based on trust. Benevolence, this virtue intends the good of the patient. Effacement of self-interest, physician vows to service without self-interest. Compassion and caring, the physician feels the pain and suffering of the patient. Compassion means to suffer with. I do not know, intellectual honesty. Sometimes we do not know and we should be honest enough to, <clears throat> to admit that. And together with the patient, go and look for the result, for, go and look for the, uh, for the information. Justice, the physician gives the patient the care and respect that the patient is due. Let me just repeat that one more time. The physician gives the patient the care and respect that he or she is due and prudence, prudence or practical wisdom. And that's deciding between altern alternatives in uncertain situations. Virtues must be linked with principles and obligations. The principle is the statement of moral truth used to guide behavior. The principles of beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice represent obligations the physician owes his patient. They serve to guide the act that results in the good outcome. The underlying ethical principle is beneficence, the duty of assisting others in need and avoiding harm. The principle is expressed by the Hippocratic maxim, be of benefit and do no harm. The physician must act in the patient's best interest, not his own or her own. Justice requires the physician to give the patient what is owed to him, what is due. The doctor-patient relationship is grounded on these obligations and depends upon the virtues inherent to medical practice. Medical ethical decisions, decision-making based on the virtues and obligations inherent to the doctor-patient encounter is concerned with, number one, the actor's behavior with the act and the consequence of the act and the outcome of the action. So it's the whole activity based on the virtue of the actor. The physician and the patient come together in an act of truth, trust, and caring. The covenantal relationship of trust between physician and patient is maintained. So, in sum, the ethics of medicine is the compendium of principles and obligations and virtues needed to achieve the ends of the profession. 
I hope this is all made clear. So there's an, the ends of the profession, which are the ends of the doctor-patient relationship. And they depend on the act of the doctor you know, to the patient, on the, the act of the moral agent, which in this case is the, is the doctor. So, and the act depends on the virtues of the doctor. So we would expect the physician to have developed the virtuous habits that would make him choose the moral good and reject the moral bad, okay? The physician and the patient come together in an act of trust and caring, remember that. The covenantal relationship of trust is maintained. The internal morality of the doctor-patient encounter, faithful to the ends of medicine, health, cure, and care, will enable the physician to make the right choice, with a good intention and result in the act that produces the best consequence for the patient. Physician has the moral obligation to ground his judgments in a normative standard set of values and follow the principles that defend the best for the patient and the process of medical, in the process of medical decision making. I had uh, made a break at this point because we get a little bit more clinical from, from now on. And uh, maybe you would have, if you have some questions, it might be a good time to bring them. All, all of what we've spoken so far is just the basic philosophical, I guess, yeah, philosoph there's nothing wrong with philosophy. Philosophy is really important. It, you know, it's the seeking of truth. So, and we should be based on truth. So it's just the philosophical basis of the doctor-patient encounter. This is the truth that we work on that, and from this truth, and our interaction with the patient that we develop that trust in the relationship between the doctor and the patient. So let's take a few minute, few minute break and uh, come back. If you have any questions, since there's a small group, I would welcome any interruptions. You can just raise your hand and we can, we can stop and, and clarify any issue or, or answer any questions, okay? All right. Just pause it really quick. Pause. All right, welcome back. Now we're gonna talk about clinical ethics. So we're gonna be a bit more clinical and clinical is important because the doctor-patient relationship is clinical. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship between two people. That's what we're talking about today, so. All right, so clinical ethics is a practical discipline. It is problem solving. There is an ethical dilemma, a problem, which demands a decision. And the physician and the patient must make a moral choice. It is essential that the judgment be grounded on a set of values and objective authority or principle that determines the morality of the action. It, can just, it, it, it cannot be based on, on a vacuum, on nothing. It, there has to be a set of principles to follow yeah. So, let me see if this will, it does. You just have to hit it hard, yeah. <laughs> so the four principles approach. This is a very clinical, clinical stuff. The four principles approach is proposed by philosophers Beecham and Childers, Tom Beecham and James Childers. Beecham is from Georgetown, I believe he's still there, and Childress is from University of Virginia. I'm not sure if he's still at UVA. This is the ethical process most frequently applied in medical ethical decision making today. The philosophers call their protocol a principle-based common morality. Common morality is defined as a set of norms that all serious persons share. Who's a serious person? That's up to who's defining a serious person, but they define a serious person as one that, serious person, they claim that all persons serious about living a moral life grasp the core dimensions of morality. So if you're serious about living a moral life, 
you grasp the core dimensions of morality, common morality. They know not to lie, not to kill or cause harm to innocent persons. According to Beecham and, and Childress, their protocol, moral medical decision making, moral decisions are based on the following four principles that you see on the screen. Respect for autonomy. It's a norm of respecting the decision making capacity of autonomous persons. Non-maleficence, a norm avoiding the causation of harm, refraining of harming the individual. Beneficence, a group of norms. Sorry. That's not the camera. That's the microphone. Oh, the camera. You can't see me? Oh, just a minute. Sorry. Maybe because I moved the screen. Let's see. No, no. As you can see the, the screen. She said, she said no eyes. Um, we put the camera down. All we see is his head, no eyes or face. Okay. That does really help too when we're watching, watching things. Andrea, Andrea, can you see? Can you see Doctor now? Yeah, I can see him now. Okay. Perfect. And you All have right. access to the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sorry about that. Where were we? Oh yeah. Respect for autonomy, non maleficence beneficence, and justice. non maleficence refraining from doing harm. Beneficence, a group of norms for providing benefits and balancing benefits against risks and costs. Justice, a group of norms for distributing benefits, risks, and costs fairly. Note that well, this set of principles is thought to reflect the values of the common morality that I just spoke about. Note that principles two, three, and four, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice are Hippocratic. Number one principle, respect for autonomy, has been added. And also, the definitions of the, uh, of the terms of the principles is a bit different and a bit more modern, I guess I should say. So for Hippocrates, non-maleficence meant avoid causing harm. It still does for them. Beneficence meant doing good for the patient, being a benefit for the patient. But these folks now describe beneficence as providing benefits and balancing benefits against risks and costs. So they've added a new dimension to it. And justice, justice was defined by Hippocrates as giving the patient what was owed to him or her, what was his due. Justice is now defined as a group of norms for distributing benefits, risks, and costs fairly, which is social justice which is allocation of resources, okay? So these issues have changed a bit. However, again, I repeat, this is the ethical process that is most frequently applied in medical ethical decision-making today. Now, principles are described by the philosophers as a reflection of the culture. What do you think about that? Reflection of the culture? What about the culture? The culture is very changeable, the culture changes month to month, day to day sometimes, week to week, right? So this makes principles subject to change with the culture. Principles should be based on truth, what we call absolute truth, and absolute truth does not change. The culture does change. So we live in a morally heterogeneous society without consensus of values, without a common view of human nature, and what it takes to live a good life. Moral deliberation can become an inconsistent process, case specific, dependent on the situation. So let's talk about this new principle that was added on by Beecham and Childress, autonomy. It's a bit of history to begin with. At the end of the second war, World War II, during the Nuremberg trials, you may remember that from your history lessons, these trials happened in the city of Nuremberg where the officials, the Nazi officials were tried after 
it was revealed that all these terrible things were done to in concentration camp inmates. So these were human experiments that were perpetrated by the Nazi doctors, Nazi doctors, okay, on concentration camp inmates. This shook the Western world. The international medical community reacted with a forceful reassertion of the Hippocratic principles. This is 2,000 years after Hippocrates wrote his Hippocratic Oath. The international community wrote and, and uh, made this forceful reassertion, and I should add with a, with a twist. So it went back to the Hippocratic principles, but with a test, twist. The reference to God that was part of the Hippocratic Oath was removed. Remember that Hi Hippocrates was a pagan, and he talked about gods in plural, lowercase. But still, a you know a transcendent God, and this was taken off the uh, the statement and in the in the in the 1940s. So some years later, in the U.S., the medical community responded, not only in human subject research but in the practice of medicine. Patient autonomy was number one. The physician-patient relationship swung. <clears throat> from a relationship dominant, dominated by paternalism to a relationship dominated by patient autonomy. And respect for individual autonomy became the principal moral obligation of the physician. But it had not been. Initially, before that time, the principles were beneficence, do good, refrain from harm, and give the patient what was due. Now, the principle, the, the most important principle, the principle moral obligation of the physician was the respect for individual autonomy, okay? Respect for autonomy may be defined as respect for the individual's right to self-determination, which is a good thing, right? Self-determination requires two conditions, freedom to exercise the free will to make your choice and the capacity of moral agency. That means, are you competent to make a choice? <clears throat> so the individual has to be competent to make the choice and is free to make the choice, not coerced by anyone or anything. It is the principle that recognizes that human beings can make reasonable choices of their own that differ from the choices of others. The human being is in part defined by the use of reason. The violation of the principle of self-determination harms the individual's human nature. So if it harms the individual's human nature, it violates the natural law. So respect for the patient's self-determination is a good thing and is essential for a healthy doctor-patient encounter. It fosters truth. It fosters trust. Traditionally, the, the physician had been considered a type of father figure, advocate for the patient. This is paternalism. Like a well-meaning father, the physician directed the care of the patient. This is a paternalistic approach to the doctor-patient relationship, no longer the standard. Paternalism restricts the freedom of the person, presumes that the patient cannot make intelligent decisions, so the physician makes the choice for the patient. Respect for the patient's self-determination seeks the good of the patient, what is medically good, what is good in terms of the patient's perceptions of his own good, what is good for human beings as members of the community, and what is good for humans as spiritual beings. The human cannot flourish without the freedom and the capacity to make choices and develop a life plan. Patient preferences, are reflected in the choices people make when facing a health problem or a medical treatment. The ability to express preferences and have others respect them is crucial to a sense of personal worth. Patient preferences are recognized by the legal system as a fundamental right, that each person has a right to control his or her own body and the right to be protected from unwanted intrusion. Physicians also express their preferences to the patient by making recommendations 
regarding an appropriate course of care. Patients express their preferences back to the physician by stating implicitly or explicitly their desire to be cared for. They accept the physician as their care, care provider, their acceptance of the physician's recommendations, treatment plan, and their hopes of satisfactory results. In general, the influence of the principle of autonomy in medical ethics has been positive. Respect of the individual's values, promotes self-worth, and sustains the integrity of the human being. Respect for autonomy has helped to increase the patient's self-determination, ability to choose and retain control over important decisions, and has served to counteract the paternalism of traditional medicine. So, in general, the influence of the principle of autonomy has been positive, has been good. And I, I will show you a couple of positive uh, results from it. But then, like all things in, in human beings can take, can take principles to extremes, and I can show you, and I, I will subsequently show you what taking it to extreme can actually result in. Informed consent is a practical, positive manifestation of respect for autonomy in the doctor-patient encounter. The physician makes a diagnosis, recommends treatment, explains the benefits and risks to the patient. The patient understands the information and accepts the proposed therapy. The encounter is characterized by good communication, mutual respect, shared decision-making, and trust. Trust is really very important. If there is not a basis of trust, then the, the patient will not trust the physician's recommendation and the, the physician will not trust the patient's response to him or to her. This closure to the patient should be in understandable language. No medical jargon should include the risks and benefits of the available treatment plans and the, risk, and, and the recommendation based on the doctor's clinical judgment. An adult patient has the capacity to consent or to refuse. Refusal of care by a competent and informed, fully informed adult should be respected, even if, it, if the refusal can lead to serious harm to the patient. And other, <clears throat> courts have upheld the legal right of adult Jehovah Witness patients to refuse life-saving blood transfusions. Another practical manifestation of the patient's self-determination is reflected in the statements of individual choice that patients are encouraged to make if they, in advance of serious disease or maybe disability. Advanced directives, a patient can designate a family member or friend to be his or her surrogate decision maker in case of disease or disability with a durable power of attorney for health care, or can state in a document advance directive the patient's wishes in case he or she is incapacitated to actively participate in the decision process. This last advance directive has some risks to it. If you do an advance directive at the age of 40, let's say an example, your, your idea of what, to, of what a, a good death may mean or what your ideas about life are may be very different from what they would be at age 60 or age 70 or even later. So rather than having an advanced directive with, with specific directions for the physicians in case you become disabled, it's better to designate a surrogate person that knows you and knows your wishes and knows your beliefs to act in your stead in case you are incapacitated and cannot make a decision in the later part of your life. So the authority of patient's preferences, however, is not unlimited. And I will repeat that, that's very important. The authority of patient's preferences is not unlimited. The respect for autonomy obligates the physician to respect the patient's preferences. We already said that, and comply, but only if they don't conflict with the goals of medicine, which are health, cure, and care. And I might add, with our church doctrine, with Catholic doctrine. We will see that with the herbs when we talk at the end 
with the directives from the church here. Yeah. So there is a new professionalism, this new professionalism that has improved on the Hippocratic tradition. In the past several decades in the United States, the practice of medicine has undergone significant transformation. A healthcare industry has developed, didn't happen before. 50 years ago, was there no such thing? There was a doctor and a patient. And there was research carried on in university centers, and that was it. There was no such thing as a healthcare industry. There is now. The physician was encouraged to join the marketplace. The doctor became a medical practitioner. The patient became his client. The practitioner sold a product that was medical care to the client who was the patient. In some way, the morally based interaction between patient and physician based on trust was undermined, suffered some change, replaced by a relationship between provider of a service and a client, just a technician. Technician that had information and skills the patient did not have, but nothing more than that. The relationship went from a covenant to a contract, to a business-like agreement. The transformation of the doctor-patient interaction has altered the doctor-patient relationship. And the consequence has been a rising distrust of the public for the profession and the ever more powerful healthcare industry. I'm sure you're all aware of all this, all the confusion that is going on with healthcare in this country and in the uh, Affordable Care Act and so on. Classically, a profession was identified by the requirements of one in extensive study, a pledge to labor for the benefit of others, not oneself, and a code of ethics. Traditionally, I mean, in the Middle Ages, there were three professions that were established, and that was medicine, the law, and the church. So there was a profession to help others. Uh, there was a code of ethics, and there, and there were and there was extensive study, intense preparation to make you capable of performing in this profession. So a new code of ethics has been developed now and they called it medical professionalism in the new millennium. A physician charter, charter meaning these are directions, this is what you need to follow. This statement was issued in the year 2002, published in many of the journals and initially published in the Annals of Internal Medicine and declared that the fundamental principles of physician professionalism were number one, the primacy of patient care. Patient care is number one in the doctor-patient relationship. Nobody has really any arguments against that, about that. Patient autonomy, of course, and social justice, not justice. Justice defined by Hippocrates is giving the person what is due, social justice, allocation of resources. Since publication in 2002, the charter has been endorsed by many organizations, approved by most American medical specialties. Many medical schools have embraced it and adopted the guidelines and the teaching of professionalism to medical students. And I bring to you an example of taking this primacy of patient care to the extreme. An article appeared in the New England Journal, which is well-known medical journal. Uh, this was last year, I believe it was April of 2017. The article was written by uh, two individuals. One was a PhD bioethicist and the other is a medical doctor, but also a PhD bioethicist. And one of them is Ezekiel Emanuel. Ezekiel Emanuel is also known as the architect of Obamacare. And he said that physicians who would decline a patient's demand on moral grounds, conscious objection, such as abortion, should be barred from practicing medicine. So the patient comes first. The patient comes first may be taken to mean the physician must lay aside ethical convictions, professional judgment in order to meet the demand of the patient. Patient come first rule is very dangerous. It turns medicine into a patient dictatorship with no checks and balances. 
It requires a unilateral confiscation of conscience rights. You leave them at home for all healthcare professionals in order to ensure that patients receive whatever controversial procedure or prescription they demand. <clears throat> so this is taking this primacy of patient care to the extreme. So we have to be careful about these principles and these guidelines. What about social justice? In the case of social justice, that's an obligation, an ethical obligation to society, not to the patient. Now we said that the patient and the physician are the two that are part of the doctor-patient encounter, right? But this is an ethical obligation to society. So the authors of the charter state that the physician must work toward the fair distribution of healthcare resources. The physician would no longer be the individual patient's advocate, but must be responsive to the healthcare of society. The obligation to the fair distribution of healthcare resources competes with the fiduciary obligation of the physician to his patient. The charter has become the new code of ethics for the medical profession, essentially replacing the Hippocratic tradition. People still talk about the Hippocratic tradition, but the definition of the terms of the principles that were part of the Hippocratic oath have been redefined. And you know that in our culture, that is one of the tools that is used by, by the, the secular part of the culture, using the same, uh, the same term, the same language that was familiar to people, that was recognized by, by most, and redefining the terms. An example is pro-choice to mean pro-abortion. So <clears throat> that would be an example of redefining language. Yeah. So, a uh, bit of a turn now. Is there a human right to health care? What are human rights? These are rights that we have received from God because we are created in his image and have inherent human dignity. Human dignity is conferred to, per to people, to persons, because we are. Because we are people not because we deserve anything or we deserve dignity or we have earned anything. Human rights do not come from society or the government. Human rights are founded in the natural or the moral law and are God given. The secular culture, which is where we live in, does not recognize this. The secular culture is in the practice of inventing new rights and uses the government to validate them uses a legal system, makes laws. The secular culture believes that human rights are man-made, imposed on society by different cultural mores. This results in rights that are changing inconsistent. We already said that the culture changes. Culture is one way today, could be one way tomorrow, in a different way next week or next month. So, now most Healthcare, most, now is healthcare a human right now? We're talking about healthcare, obviously, but is healthcare a human right? So uh, most people would support a general moral right to healthcare. Based on two arguments. Number one, the argument of the community and the argument of the individual. The community must be protected. The individual must be protected. His rights must be protected. As a member of the community, the health of one individual affects the health of others. An example is communicable disease. One 10 year old kid in the classroom with measles can be the source of a measles epidemic in the school that may even go into other parts of the community. So the health of one member can affect the health of the whole community. Also, the well being of a member of the community contributes to the common good. A person who is healthy and has well being, it feels good, can contribute to the common good. The person who is not, who is sickly, <clears throat> cannot contribute to the common good as well. And the conditions for fulfillment in their chosen path of life ought to be available to the members of the community. So these conditions that are necessary for us to pursue our happiness, to pursue our goal, fulfill ourselves, 
to the utmost of our capacity should be available in the community as well. So in this case, condition is good health. So if, you, if we go back to the Declaration of Independence, then you could say, so life in good health allows you to, to exercise your liberty and to pursue your happiness. Life, liberty, and happiness. So good health is essential for this process. So what is the common good? We talked about the common good. The common good is the defined as the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. The sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and with less difficulty, more easily. The human person lives in community. Remember that the Lord created the first man, we called him Adam, and very soon after that, he created Eve because Adam was so lonely, Adam was by himself. Adam and Eve are the first community. The civil society ought to work to preserve the health and welfare of the individual members so that they can flourish and contribute to the common good. So the healthy person, the person with well-being and who is in good health can contribute to the common good much more effectively than the one who is not. A good society seeks the good, respects persons, promotes the social welfare, and preserves the peace and security of its members. Let me just repeat that, because that's kind of important. Because <clears throat> in, in our society, especially in this country, our government has become more and more intrusive in our lives, telling people not just to obey the laws. Now, if you find a red light in front of you on the road, you should stop. Everybody knows that, and everybody should obey that law. But our government has become more and more intrusive in telling us how to think sometimes and how to believe and what to believe. So, but a good society should seek the good, respect persons, the individuals, promote the social welfare, preserve the peace, police force, and security of its members. So government should be secure, preserve the peace, and the security of its members and stop there, okay? And that includes access to medical care. Access to care should be viewed within the context of rights and justice. Justice gives the individual what is their due, the individuals what is their due. The members of the community should have access to a basic level of care. What is basic health care? Now, basic health care is to be determined, defined by the community, as well as the mode of delivery, be that free market like we have in this country or government based like social medicine in Canada and in Great Britain. So access to, hair, access to care, access to a basic level of, of health care is a right and is the just thing to do for all individuals. Are we our brother's keeper? Yes, we are. We are our brother's keeper. As followers of Christ, we are to love and care for our brothers and our sisters, our sisters and our brothers, yes. Last but not least, let's talk about, let's talk about herbs. The church has published a list of directions to aid the healthcare worker in the delivery of care. They call them directives, which are a list of directions. And I understand, I, I asked Henry before, and he told me that, yes, you all, you all have this little booklet. Really nice, important information, all in, summarized very well. Ethical and religious directives for Catholic healthcare services. The purpose of these ethical and religious directives is twofold. First, to reaffirm the ethical standards of behavior in healthcare that flow from the church's teaching about the dignity of the human person. Remember, the dignity of the human person is there because we have received it as a gift from God, because we were created in his image. 
it's not anything that we earn and it's not anything, not anything that we develop and it has nothing to do with our contribution to society. And last but not least, most importantly, it is God given and not conferred by the government or society. And second, to provide authoritative guidance, guidance in certain moral issues, specific issues that face Catholic health care today. And that includes such issues as abortion, uh, and others. So the moral teachings that we profess flow principally from the natural law, the moral law, understood in the light of revelation, revelation that has been entrusted to the church. From this source, the church has derived its understanding of the nature of the human person, of human acts, and of the goals that shape human activity. The dialogue between medical science and Christian faith has its primary purpose, the common good of all persons. It presupposes that science and faith do not contradict each other. Many people nowadays in the secular culture think that faith and science are the opposite. One contradicts each other, but faith and sciences do not contradict each other. Both are grounded in respect for truth, and freedom. They do not contradict each other. They're grounded in respect for truth and freedom. The directives are many. In fact, there are upwards of 70, I believe 72 directives. Chapter three or part three, they don't call it chapters, but part three is the professional patient relationship part or chapter. Out of that chapter, which has a number of them, I can't recall how many, about 20 or so, I picked nine, which to me are the most important. That's my opinion. <clears throat> it's not based on any specific facts. I believe these are the more important ones that we should, we should use to guide our, ourselves in the professional patient relationship. Number one, I chose a person in need of healthcare and the professional healthcare provider. Again, the term provider. I don't like the term provider. We don't service clients, we help patients. However, healthcare provider is used frequently in the directives. Provider means someone who provides a service, you know, like you said before, I just don't like the term. But what's, well, <clears throat> this person, this individual accepts the, per the patient as a person, as a patient, and they enter into a relationship that requires mutual respect and Trust, I would put trust first. Trust is the number one, the most important, based on trust, honesty, and appropriate confidentiality. The healthcare professional has the knowledge and experience to pursue the goals of healing, the maintenance of health, and the compassionate care of the dying, taking into account the patient's beliefs and spiritual needs and the moral responsibilities of all concern, again, the ends of medicine are the ends of the doctor-patient encounter, health, cure, and the care. Each person must be given the opportunity to make an advanced directive for their medical treatment. And we said, I said before, that the best way to do this is by, design, by assigning a surrogate. The surrogate that you pick, that you choose, should probably not be your spouse, although that would be the, the inclination of most people. But your spouse is probably about your same age, and your spouse is very much emotionally involved if it's an end-of-life situation. It's best to choose somebody that is younger, like a child, child of yours, that knows how you feel, what your beliefs are, and that will act for you according to what your worldview, your, your beliefs are. Each person may identify in advance a representative to make healthcare decisions as his or her surrogate in the event that the person loses the capacity to make healthcare decisions. This is something that happens nowadays. Free and informed healthcare decisions by the patient or by the surrogate will be followed so long as it does not contradict church doctrine. And I would add that so long as they don't go against the ends of medicine health care and cure. No person should be obliged, obligated to submit to a health care procedure that the person has judged with a free and informed conscience, consent, 
not to provide a reasonable benefit without imposing excessive risk and burden. The patient, the person should be allowed to refuse. Healthcare providers are to respect each person's privacy and confidentiality. And then lastly, an ethics committee or some other form of ethics consultation should be available to assist in particular ethical situations. These are the nine directives that I find most meaningful in the doctor-patient relationship. Now I would like to open for questions, for questions from, from the folks here and from those of you who are watching uh, online. When you were talking about, um, when you mentioned the, the basic. Will they be able to hear your question yes. or should I repeat yes, it? Yes, no, no, they will be able to hear. Um, the right to basic care for the members of the community. Access of care, access to care. Yeah. Right. Oh, oh, you're referring to uh, free access to this basic care? That to be determined by the community. Uh, so I think this sets this lays the responsibility in you know, on the lap of the community. It's the community to determine. It's not the government that tells the community what to do. The community should determine what the basic, you know, what basic healthcare is for that community. It may be different for different communities. All right, and then in the other one is the mode of care, the delivery of care. Do you, you know? So some communities, communities would choose a free market kind of delivery of care. So other communities may choose what is called socialized medicine. If you choose socialized medicine, then that is the government or the, the, the government that, that controls the, medicine, the medical care to all of the, all of the communities. But the best way to, do act, to access care, to, to do the access of care to actually ac access care to all of those is to leave it in the hands of the community. And each community will determine that. Can you refer to any specific community that uh, is actually doing so? There are communities now, nowadays there are a number of, of actually Catholic communities that are, that have uh, healthcare plans that uh, have actually sprung up and, and are branching out in, in the, uh, you know, throughout the country. I was recently at the Catholic Medical Association uh, uh, National Conference, and there were a couple of communities uh, of medical, and a couple of, of uh, uh, health plans that service different communities that spoke about how they do that. And so it is, it is going on in this country. It's small and it's beginning, but it can happen. And these are accessible. These are available. And if any, if anyone is interested, you can you can go to the to the website to the the site of the Catholic Medical Association, and that information will be available there. And you can you can actually get those to find out. Like if you have any community, any those any of those communities in your any of those health plans in your community, your specific area where you live, they do work. How do you ensure that the community isn't going to choose like a you know completely capitalistic approach and you know go against extremes greed, right and extreme yeah right and there you know just like the the extreme in the primacy of care you know not allow people to have you know conscious objections of conscience uh, then extremes are always possible and that is something that we have to deal with with you know it's part of our human nature people will do that so when 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 extremes like that happen, then a superior authority needs to be called in. So there may be times when the community itself cannot solve the problem. And the community, you know, let's say that the community is the state, the state of whatever, Florida. If the state of Florida has a problem and there, ha you know, there, there are extremes that are going on, then the superior authority needs to intervene and then that will be the federal government. So there will be times when that will be needed. But you know the basic decision should be made at the grassroots level. Subsidiarity, solidarity, and subsidiarity are, are basic principles of ours. Yeah. At the basic level, at the community level, at the grassroots level. 
I was just listening to something I was talking about the like we're talking about the nature of extremes that people could have more of a conversation where they're willing to meet in the middle and actually discuss listening to one another right. instead of going to this extremes that seems to be a lot more productive than like same with healthcare. But that that you know it, it seems like recently that just doesn't happen in, you know very frequently anymore, right? And and that uh, right and that that is very sad. It's very sad the way that our culture, that our country is going. <clears throat> because because when there is no dialogue, then then that's when extremes happen. Yeah. If you you know if if you have dialogue, you know people will see the points of view of those you know, of those that disagree, and and it doesn't mean that they will agree with you, but at least they will see your point of view. And they will understand, but if there's no dialogue, no discussion. Yeah, right. No, no discussion. Then, then that doesn't happen. It is, it is very sad. Any other questions? Any, any questions from the field? I hope that the, that you know, that the sound and everything came through well. There were a few glitches, but overcome. Henry helped me. Any questions from, uh, who was it that called, Andrea? Yeah. Andrea? Can we have access to some of uh, the notes? Are you gonna be sending uh, uh, like a file on? Would you like that? I, I could do I that. I would love to. Yeah. I would love to. I could do that, yeah, right. How do I do that? Send it to Father Chofi? You could probably, probably send it to him and we'll send it to us. Okay, I can do that. I can send you this. Yes. Yeah, right. Because I went into a lot more detail than what the slides show, of course. Uh, yeah, of course, I can do that. Any more, any questions, any more questions? I think that, I think that maybe, maybe it was last year, somebody made a comment about Aristotle. Uh, I think that the basic, you know, basic, the basic philosophy in, in, is what we base our, our Western culture. So I, I think it's important to spend a few minutes and talk about, you know, what these, you know, ancient people felt and, and what we, uh, I hope you're not all, all bored with, with all of these, uh, uh, you know, basic philosophical, you know, issues, but I think they're important and they actually define what we do and, and help us understand in the, the doctor patient encounter. Yeah. No, oh, very interesting that the uh, history of where all the Hippocratic oath came from, how do we get to here? And how we're going backwards. And how we are we are going backwards, yes. That's also very unfortunate, yes. In the last few years, maybe ten or twenty years, maybe not more than that, the uh, this physician assisted suicide uh, has you know the, the, the idea of doctors killing patients has surged again. <laughs> and uh, it has at first in Europe but now in, in America, in Canada and the United States. Uh, and in Europe, euthanasia is practiced freely in many countries. Not just physician assisted So you know the difference between one and the other? You, Euth again, you know? Euthanasia is when the uh, physician or, or, or the physician kills the patient uh, when the patient is near death, very elderly uh, or suffering and it's based on compassion to alleviate the pain that the patient is suffering. So there is direct killing of the patient by the physician. Physician assisted suicide is when the patient, when the physician gives the patient the means for killing himself or herself. And in our day and age, it's usually a prescription of lethal drugs, which the patient takes home and uses them to kill himself or herself. Uh, so the secular 
culture makes a distinction between the two. And if you speak to secular people, which is most everybody, they would make that distinction. Our church does not make that distinction. Catholic doctrine doesn't make that distinction because Catholic doctrine says that when the doctor gives the patient a prescription, this specific prescription, like 100 uh, pills to uh, take all at the same time, it's with the intention, with the intent, that the person is going to use them to kill themselves. So even though he is not actively doing the killing, he's providing the means. So the intent is for the person to kill themselves. So as far as, as, as church doctrine is concerned, physician assisted, assisted suicide is considered a form of euthanasia. Uh, in uh, the last century, but not the, toward the very end of the last century, I believe it was 1997, the state of Oregon in the United States legalized physician-assisted suicide. After that, six other states have done that. I believe it's six now. California has legalized it. Washington state has legalized physician-assisted suicide. Uh, Montana, Vermont, the District of Columbia. Uh, so euthanasia, like the direct killing, of a person, of a patient, by a doctor is still not legal. So if a doctor does that direct killing, then he is, you know, it's, it's considered a homicide. So it would be punished by law. But physician-assisted suicide, in the other hand, on the other hand, is not punished by law in these states. So, and there are more and more states that are actually trying to pass this uh, law. There's like 20 other, 25, I believe, I counted the last time I looked at that, 25 other states that have tried unsuccessfully so far to pass a law depenalizing physician-assisted suicide, but they've been defeated. The legislature has defeated it. Hawaii was the last one who did. <clears throat> that makes six, I believe. Yeah, so this is where we are going now. And it's, it's just, it is sad, but it's like we're going all the way back to the ancient Greeks, remember? The reason why the Hippocratic Corpus, the Hippocratic School, stood up to say the physicians are healers, they're not killers. This role of executioner is not part of medicine. They stood up to the culture and they said enough is enough. And slowly, the culture changed and the physician healer became the norm. We're back to where we started 2,500 years ago. Incredible. It is incredible, but that's, that's what people do. People don't learn from history or from other person's mistakes or experiences. They continually compete, continually commit the same mistakes over and over again. So it looks like we're going that way. So very soon there's going to have to be another Hipp Hippocratic Oath. We'll have to call it <laughs> by another name, but somebody's got to say enough is enough. The healthcare worker is a healer, not a killer. Go ahead. Um, like the, we were talking before about the autonomy of patients and how I've heard about a case in Belgium where it went so far that there was a patient who said, I need to die. She just had a, I don't know if you heard about this, and it went so far where I believe she was given medication to kill herself because she just thought it was almost like what you're talking about, you know, not having to change mm -hmm. the sex. Uh, she was to the point where she just knew that she couldn't live anymore. Perfectly healthy. Right, right. right. And, and, and uh, they went through. I, I believe. That person probably was suffering from mental illness, and that wasn't considered. In Belgium, you're talking about Bel Belgium and Holland and, you know, and the Netherlands are the, do, are the two countries where euthanasia and a physician-assisted suicide are prevalent. I, re I read not long ago that in the Netherlands, about 5% of all deaths, of all deaths, are due to doctors killing patients. <laughs> That's a large number if you think about the totality. 5% of all deaths are that, thereabouts. Don't quote me on that because I can't remember the exact number, but it's a large number. Uh, the Netherlands, Holland was the first country to start doing this. 
the Netherlands started in the 1980s. Excuse me. And in the 1980s, the physician assisted suicide and euthanasia were still illegal, but the government looked sideways when it happened. And even though it wasn't legally depenalized, it did not penalize any of the doctors who did it. And a couple of years, or several years later, I believe it was like 2002, that was 20 years later, that there's an actual law that says that euthanasia is a legal procedure and physician assisted suicide is a legal procedure in the Netherlands. It is considered part of medical practice. So they have actually redefined medical practice to include the killing of patients. And so is Belgium. The same situation in Belgium. Belgium followed the Netherlands. In Belgium, they are euthanizing, euthanizing children. In the Netherlands, they're euthanizing children. They're euthanizing newborns that are born with defects. And the parents request the doctors to kill the child because they don't want to live with a child that is born with a defect. And that is a perfectly legal reason to euthanize the baby, the, the newborn. In Belgium, they are also euthanizing people with mental illness. The people with mental illness are not totally responsible for their decisions, you know, by definition, that's, that's, that should be. And these folks are, are, have diagnoses of schizophrenia and uh, clinical depression under the care of psychiatrists and uh, on medication. Uh, and uh, they, choose, they, they choose to die. So like you mentioned before, these people just choose to die and they die. In Switzerland, Switzerland, and so in Belgium and in the Netherlands, both euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide are legal. In Switzerland, physician-assisted suicide is legal, but not so euthanasia. But in Switzerland, they have what are called suicide clinics or death clinics, because they have a law, well, they have a law that they, they can euthanize people they can kill people that come from outside the country. In most of these countries where euthanasia and physician assisted suicide are legal, one of the requirements is that the person be a citizen of that country. In Switzerland, that is not a requirement. So they have these, these uh, uh, death clinics where people come from all over the world, from places where physician assisted suicide is not legal, to be killed and they come and they are killed by, by a healthcare professional, not necessarily a doctor. These are usually nurses in, in Switzerland, but they have a doctor that supervises the killing. And they come from Australia and from other places to be killed, to, to the death clinics. I remember a case very recently of a gentleman, I don't, know, I don't remember where he came from, I flew to Switzerland with his family to to be killed. To be killed because he was like a hundred and something years old and he just didn't want to continue living. And that was incredible. Right. right. How far have we gone? There's well, many backwards. back we're going backwards. Yeah, there's gone. there's many examples of that. And would you know that's another going to the extreme, right? Extremes do happen. They happen in our society and our Western society. Uh, you know, a lot more frequently than, than in societies that, that are under a dictatorial uh, government, actually. Because dictatorial governments control people, control not just what they do, but sometimes what they think, too, you know. But in countries or societies that are free, then these extremes will happen. And it's up to the government, it's up to the, you know, the highest authority to intervene when these extremes are happening. But what if the the, the, what if the authority, the supreme authority is in, in, you know, is in favor of these extremes and that happens. And so then these extremes become, become law like it's happening in these countries. And there, is, there is one uh, situation that has been in all the newspapers, you may have even seen it, of two elderly people. They were not young, they were elderly, they were in their 60s, but 60s nowadays is not really that old, you know, if you're healthy. A 60-year-old can live a very good, fruitful, 
life and actually contribute to the common good, you know, without any problem. Uh, the husband died. I can't remember exactly from what. And then the wife decided that she could not live without him. So it was like Romeo and Juliet kind of a thing. So this was all over the media as this love affair that ended in death and glamorizing this terrible thing uh, that, that had happened. And, and uh, so actually, no, I correct myself. Actually, the husband had been euthanized because he had a disease. He had an illness that he did not want to live with. The, the wife was healthy, but she decided that after living without him for a month or two, she decided that she didn't want this. So she decided to go to the, you know, to the death place to, you know, just to apply for. I don't know exactly how they do that, but there are groups that you, you know, you do it online probably, and you have, <clears throat> and they come to your house and uh, with a counselor and give you the ways to kill yourself. So this is where we are. So just like Margaret Mead said 50, 70 years ago, in the middle of the 20th century, society is always trying to make the healthcare worker provide death. So it's up to us that are living today to promote the role of the physician healthcare worker as a healer, someone who provides help, who provides the cure, who provides care, not who provides death. It's the culture of death that St. Paul, John Paul II talked about. It's everywhere. Yes. <clears throat> and in that note, I don't want to end in that very pessimistic note because there's a lot that we can do, even though it looks like we're all going, going that way, that the society is going that way, that our culture is going that way. There's, there's, you know, there's stuff we can do. We can speak out. Where? In the public square. Right here, we're talking about people of, that have like worldviews. But in the public square, where there are people that are of a different worldview. We have to speak in the public square. They will throw rotten eggs and tomatoes at us. They will. They will try to assassinate one's personality and harm our family and all of that, the people that disagree. But we have a responsibility and we have to talk about it. We have to say so. We have to go and talk to the lawgivers, to the legislators about how terrible it is to have physician-assisted suicide legalized in your state. <clears throat> Hopefully that will not happen, at least not for the time being in our state in Florida, because there is a law that says that, that prohibits that at this point, but laws can change. Laws have been made to change and we see how they do. So. Talking about the, you're saying death is all around us. I'm talking about, you know, speaking up in the public square. What about, it just seems like every day there's a new corporation that comes up to be found doing something that is inherently bad for the public health. And it seems like people just get away with it. Like what now there's this lawsuit against LaCroix that they have these terrible, you know, uh, or the red tides going on you know, from, from agricultural and nu nutrient fertilizer, you know, pollution. I wonder the death surrounding us, where do we draw the line? Could, is it gonna be to the point where any company could just say, oh yeah, oops, we poisoned all these people and then they just move on. I mean. There's scandal after scandal, you know. Um, I know I kind of went off on another tangent with the death card, but it's crazy. You know, I, I think that the the overseer needs to be aware of these these issues, and when they that's going to extremes again, you know. And you know what you mentioned is extreme to in this case for profit. Right. right. It, the the reasons for you know are are, are many. But it's, the extremes are usually bad. You know, our friend Aristotle talked about that too. He talked about the golden mean, the middle, you know, one extreme or the other extreme, you know, they're, they're not good. It's the mean that is the best, the golden mean of Aristotle. So whenever that happens, then, you know, the overseer authority needs to come in and actually 
prevent these things from happening. However, how does the overseer authority know about this? Like in our case, let's say the federal government, it's up to us. It's up to us to let them know. So if there is enough cry from the public, then they will listen and act. So it is up to us. So that's what I meant by the public square. We have to right, right. speak in the public square. And the public square is not necessarily like speaking on television so that the whole country can listen to us. Public square starts in your own home, mm -hmm. in your own community. Yeah. Start local. You're, yeah, right. You start, you start local. You start at the grassroots. Right. And then that will grow. That will grow. And if it's in the Lord's will, it will grow. Because when you're in his will, the Holy Spirit is right there, your partner. And it will grow. It will grow. If it doesn't grow, it may be because it's not in your, in his will, or at least not the way that you're doing it may not be the way that the Lord wants you to do it. Uh, but the culture of death is, is really all, it's, it's, it's among us and has been among us for, for, for a long time. But nowadays, even more so. So don't go home thinking that all is lost. I'm repeating myself, but I think it's important because all is not lost. It is not lost. There's a lot of work to do, but there's things that we can do. There's things that we can do. We do not, we should not be quiet. Greed has a lot to do with that. Greed has a lot, but there's many motivations. Greed is one. Greed is one of the most intense motivations that the human person has, you know. Money and power, you know. Everybody wants money and power. Everybody wants money and power. Uh, everybody should not want money and power. We should have enough money to live a decent uh, life and, and, and power to, you know, for yourself. But extremes are not good. Extremes are not good. Never think that you're not, sometimes I hear people say, well, what can I do? I can't do very much. I'm sort of, I'm just like one person, but, you know, but think about 2000 years ago, there were only 12 of them, 11 to begin with. And they all went out and look what happened. 300 years later, the Western world was Christian. 12 people, 11 people, oh, they, they selected another one to take Judas's place. But at the beginning, there were only 11, just 11 people, and so a lot of them not very well educated. All of us here have degrees and stuff, better educated than the apostles were. And look what they did. They were in his will. So they went out and they, they evangelized. We can evangelize, we can evangelize. We can do that. Okay. All right, anything else? Anything from, from the online folks? You've been very quiet today. How many are there? I think it's just two. It's, this is Andrea? Yes. Uh huh. No, we're only two online. Oh, there's only two online. Oh, okay. And who was the other person? Diane. <laughs> father Diane. Oh, Father Diane. Any, any, any comments from you, Father? I hope you could hear me. Yeah, he could hear us. Yeah. Hmm. I guess not. Huh? Well, I, I think everything you said was on point. <laughs> I agree with everything, so... Well, very good, very good. So you're ready to go out and speak in the public square. You first talk to your, to your relatives, your husband, your, your wife, your children, your mother, your father, and your neighbors, and then you talk to the people at church, mm -hmm. and you talk to, and then after that, who knows? You may be speak, a speaker on television. Every, every year I go to March for Life, so that's a, okay. that's a big one, I guess. All right, all right. 
If you're local, there is a, uh, um, a, a uh, link tomorrow uh, at uh, US 1. The Respect for Life? Respect for Life. Uh -huh. yeah. Wh when is it? At what time? It's tomorrow, 2 to 3. 2 to 3 um, on US 1 and what? US 1 around, I think it's different parishes at different sites. Uh, I belong to Little Flower and we have the 63rd uh, Street. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's along that, along there. Go to 63 and and uh, it's between, uh, probably between 57 and uh, and Sunset, which is 72, something like that. So now you're talking about respect for life. Yeah, that would be good. I, I did see something uh, from... Extend the invitation to, to, to you, Dr. Uh -huh. On October the 14th, that's a right. Sunday, St. Raymond Church, in the parish hall. We're going to be having a brunch hosted by the Archives of Miami and the Knights of Malta, uh, honoring Miss Mancini, the founder of uh, March for Life. So it would be great if you can well, thank come you. and join us and support us there. Um, I can send you the invitation uh, for the link so that you right. can register. I think I have that. Oh, you do? I think I, think I have it because I get, all over I get emails from the Archives. the new director for Respect Life Ministries for the Archives is the one because I know that, that right, because yes, I know Mr. that is coming and Father Trump is coming. Mrs. Crown is, is retired, right? She has retired. Yes. retired yeah. Perfect. I'll see you there. Okay, all right, very good. Well, thank you very much for your attention. We it's not really 10 o'clock, it's 11, right? Yeah, right. yes, 11. Yeah. 11 yeah. <laughs> it says 10 o'clock on the, on the clock there. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. And I'll make sure that I send the, uh, my notes to uh, Father Cho, and he can let you all have that, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you.